Welcome to our line by line, verse by verse study through the book of Acts. We are currently in Acts chapter 19. We will be covering verses 11 through 20 in our study today. Our goal is to find out what the Bible says so we can know what to believe. As believers, we probably believe mostly what is correct, but certainly we've got some things that we believe that are wrong. And we don't want to go to the scriptures to try to reinforce what we believe, but we want to search the scriptures to find out what they say. Now, this is our 49th study in the book of Acts. So we've really been diving in. And if you would like to catch up, there's a couple of ways you could do that. You could go to calvarytucson.com. You could click on teaching. You can go navigate to Acts, go all the way back to Acts chapter one if you want to. And you can listen to all of those 49 teachings and catch up to where we are. Or you could subscribe to the church's podcast. Now, the name of our podcast is Truth Quest Podcast. We want to wear the belt of truth and we want the truth. And in that you get all of our teachings plus our hot topics. We have 10 minute hot topics ish that we put together on different topics to really highlight what these things are about. And you also get our Q&A. So we do an hour Q&A every week where we answer questions from you on social media. If you'd like to join us, it is Saturday at 3.30. Just go onto YouTube or Facebook, go to Calvary Tucson or Robert Furrow, uh, and you'll be able to connect and ask questions on that. But you get them and you can listen to them while you're driving through the podcast, wherever you get your podcast at, you can subscribe to it. You can you could go backwards uh, to go to Acts chapter one and you could listen through the book of Acts through our, our, our podcast as well, through Truth Quest Squad podcast. All right, so the title of the message today is Effective Fighting in the spiritual realm, keys to winning. We want to make sure that we are effective in the spiritual battle. There is the real world, the world that we see. There is the, the world of, of, where, of flesh and of, of material. And then there is a spiritual realm that is very real, but unseen. And the Bible tells us that what's happening in the spiritual realm is more significant to you than what's happening in the, what we would call the seen world. The unseen world has things happening that we don't even think about. The Bible says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So you got a struggle going on in your life right now? You got a struggle going on in your marriage or maybe with some of your children or maybe at your job or maybe at school or maybe with some friends? You do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and a spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. I forget this often and I'll have a struggle going on and someone will say to me, could this be a spiritual battle? And I'm like, yeah, probably is. But I hadn't thought about that. Understanding that we have help in that unseen realm from angels. The Bible says in Hebrews 1.14, are they not all ministering spirits sent to minister to those who have life? The word minister means serve. So they are serving spirits sent to serve us who have life as we are going about the work of spreading the gospel. Now, God could have bypassed us and had angels bring the gospel. That happens in later on in the book of Revelation near the end of the world. An angel brings the gospel around the world. But right now, God allows us to be the light that shines around him. And we are we have angels that protect us. But we also have demonic forces or evil spirits who are looking to get an advantage in your life. And I've got good news for you. They are limited. You are filled with the spirit of God. What they can do to you. They are, if you are in Christ, the evil one can't touch you. Jesus said, behold, I give you power or authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will by any means hurt you. But you can give place to the devil. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And you can make decisions in your life that allow him to get a foothold in your life. And so you want to make sure that you're not doing them. So we're going to talk about some of them today as we look at these unusual events that are happening here. Now, remember, Jesus had authority over demons and Christ is inside of you and you are in Christ. So his authority transfers to us because he's in us and we are in him. So when Jesus cast out demons with a word, he didn't go through this whole thing about cast out demons. It took him a long time to do it. He cast them out with a word. And we're also told in another place that he cast out demons, not allowing them to speak. 
So he wasn't like some of these people that are involved in demonology today where they're like, what's your name, spirit? They will start talking to the demon. And the person who's demon-possessed starts talking like, my name is Legion. You know, they go through this whole thing. That's not what happened when Jesus took authority over evil spirits. He didn't let them speak because they knew who he was. In the spiritual realm, we're going to see this in our text. <clears throat> our text. <laughs> they know who you are. The, the demonic realm, this, these evil spirits, know who you are. They know if you're playing games. They know if you're serious. They know whether you've got things right with him, with God or not. And that's why when it says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, the very next thing it says is put on your armor, which is salvation, the helmet of salvation, knowing you are saved, the breastplate of righteousness, making sure things are right between you and God, righteousness, things are right between you and God, the belt of truth, you're not believing some lie. You're not hanging on to a lie contrary to what the Word of God says just because maybe you heard it before or it used to have some kind of meaning to you. Now you reject it because it's a lie and you wear the belt of truth. Your feet prepared with the gospel because that's the spiritual battle. It's over the souls of men and women. Today, wars are fought over land. The war in Israel is over the area of Gaza and all of Israel, really. And the area of Ukraine is fought over the area of Ukraine. Spiritual battles is over land, the souls of men and women. Remember, we were made from dust and to dust we will go. And the enemy wants to attack people that we love, that we care about. And our spiritual battle makes a difference when we end up standing for him. And that authority that Jesus has, we have as well. Now, I almost named this, path, uh, this message unusual events. And you're going to see why here in a moment. Paul is in Ephesus. He's been here for a while. He has been in the synagogue and then left the synagogue and then secured a school of the school of Tyrannius where he's teaching daily there. And the last thing we read about Paul in Ephesus was that the, the, the spirit of God was working mightily in Asia. So throughout all of Turkey, Ephesus is like this headquarters where Paul is teaching daily, but out of that is going these people who are being taught and the spirit of God is moving mightily. Now we read something It's a little strange. Verse 11, now God worked unusable, unusual, not unusable. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Now, unusual miracles. Sometimes God does the unusual. By definition, the unusual is rare. It's unusual. It doesn't happen all the time. God works in ways that we can easily put our stamp of approval on. But then God works in ways that we go, eh, that makes me feel uncomfortable. I find that there are these passages in the Bible of the unusual. And pastors generally try to sterilize them to make them more palatable. And I would caution against that. Let's teach the word of God as the word of God is. The word of God doesn't need me standing in between you and the word. Trying to make the word of God easier for you to receive. I think sometimes God wants us to be shocked by what we see, wants us to see what's going on in the, real in, the, in the real world and behind the scenes. And sometimes God does unusual things in your life. It's, they're rare. They don't happen to everybody. But the, God does unusual things. What kind of unusual things did he do here? They even took handkerchiefs and aprons, were brought from the body of Paul to sick, to the sick and diseased, left them, and diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So they took the sweatband and the apron of Paul and they sent it out. And when people got it, they were healed. That's unusual. That's strange. That's rare by definition, but it happens. You remember Jesus when he's going to, the, to, to pray for Jairus' daughter and the crowds are in around him and that a woman comes up that's had a flow of blood for many years and she touches the hem of his garment thinking, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. So she touched the Messiah, the Son of God, God incarnate on the hem of his robe. And when he did that, she was healed. And Jesus said, stop. Power's gone out of me. Who touched me? And the, the crowds are thronging around him. And his disciples are like, everybody touching you? Every, everybody? And Jesus said, power has gone out from me because by faith she believed. 
And when people are receiving this sweatband and this apron, God's moving in this unique way where people are receiving it and they're by faith trusting in God. And Paul is an apostle. So receiving this from an apostle, we don't have apostles today. There were the 12 apostles. They had a certain kind of authority in the early church. And one of them was the ability to be able to heal. Not all of the time, by the way. At one point, Paul doesn't send Timothy a sweatband for his stomach ailments. He says, take a little wine for your stomach, probably because the water they were drinking had problems and wine, the alcohol in the wine would kill the bacteria that was in the water or whatever else was going on. And so instead of sending him a sweatband, he said, take a little wine for your stomach. So he didn't always have this. This is unusual. It's even unusual for Paul. Paul wasn't like starting to sell sweatbands for $149.99. That was the television evangelist of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Those guys sold ropes that they would pray over a knot, supposedly. Then they would sell you for $99.95. Why $99.95? Talk about marketing. They don't want it to be $100. That might be too much for you. So $99.95, that could be something you could pay. You wouldn't pay $100. But then you get your, the, your knot prayed over by the evangelist ah, and you untied it over your hurt knee and the power of God would heal your knee. Bunch of charlatans, bunch of money grubbing. I'll be polite. But it's true, isn't it? To sell God that way, to sell God to people like that. I have own, own experience of my life of a person like that. When my dad had Lou Gehrig's disease, he went to a faith healer who declared that he could be healed, who declared that he had the power to heal anybody he laid hands on. If that was the truth, why wasn't he in hospitals emptying them out? Why was he instead at the Albuquerque Convention Center passing out Kentucky Fried Chicken buckets to everybody and telling people to get up and stand in line while he hit him in the head and knocked him over? Why was he doing that if he really had the ability to be able to heal? I could tell you from my father's perspective that when he left there, he was up, he was up in spirit, that he really thought God could do something. But after a little while, it became evidence that he still had Lou Gehrig's disease. And I can tell you that the depression is his, his life, from my perspective, got even worse at that point. And that makes what these people are doing is just evil down to the core. But these were unusual miracles and God was doing them. Now, one, something else it would do is that evil spirits went out of them. So there's this spiritual activity around Ephesus, and I want to talk to you about that in a while, about why that is, but there are demonic spirits that are there for a specific reason. And when they get the apron or they get the headband, then the demon leaves. Again, remember, Jesus cast them out with a word. He cast them out, let, not letting them speak. And, and when they get this sweatband, the demon leaves. Now we read in this, in this activity of these demonic spirits, verse 13, and some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists. These aren't Christian. These are Jewish. So it's some of the Jewish itinerant exorcists. So they saw the activity. Remember, Mary Magdalene had had seven demons cast out of her. The Bible doesn't say she was a prostitute. I asked somebody one time who wanted to insist that she was a prostitute why they were insisting. They said, well, we just assumed. You don't assume a woman's a prostitute ever. She was possessed by seven demons. And here... Uh, these Jewish exorcists see these people possessed and, and demons throughout the Bible manifest themselves in different ways. Uh, there's a child who tries to throw himself in the fire and water and kill themselves and Jesus delivers him. There's a demon that's in caves that runs around chasing people and breaks chains. He's so strong, he can break chains. So there's different ways in which demons manifest and these Jewish exorcists are seeing the manifestation of these spirits and they're trying to help people. And it says they took it upon themselves to call on the name of Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you by, by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Now, this is somebody who doesn't have Christ, who is now calling on the name of Christ, as if the name of Jesus is the magic. It's not a relationship with Christ that matters. It's just the name of Jesus. No, it's you knowing Christ. And when you know Christ, love him, live for him, have been born again, then when you use the name of Jesus, there is power in it. The Bible says, behold, Jesus said to his disciples, behold, I give you power to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will by any means hurt you. It's because we have a relationship. These guys don't. So it says also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. Now, Rome kept a lot of records and there were sections of Rome that kept records over different religions. And we know a lot of the chief priests from the region of what is modern-day Turkey, what was in that day called Asia Minor. 
because Rome was in control of these regions. And we never read of a high priest by the name of Sceva. So some say, well, this guy was not really high priest. He was, he was a charlatan. He wasn't really high priest. We, we don't know. Maybe they just didn't have a record of him. Maybe the record didn't survive. We don't have all the records from Rome. So to say that he wasn't a chief priest, maybe he's pushing things a little bit because arguments from silence aren't very good because archaeology could suddenly discover somewhere in Ephesus a Sceva who was a high priest. And then you'd be like, well, I guess he was. So it says Sceva, the Jewish high, uh, chief priest, sorry, not high priest, but chief priest, who did so. So these seven sons went to a man who was possessed and said, we exercise you in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. And the evil spirit answered and said, verse 15, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? I love it. It's like demonic spirits know whether or not you're really serving God. They're in the spiritual realm, which I'm going to argue is the realm that really matters, and they see where you are. And they know whether or not you have the hedge of protection from Christ, or you don't. They see it. Who are you? Now, a couple of things. Uh, Jesus, as I said, cast them out with a word. And we need to be confident that we are in Christ if there are evil spirits out there. I think if we could see behind the veil here today, we would see angelic beings, because the Bible says they're here to serve us who have life. And so there are angels that are here. And I think there would be demonic spirits here as well. I think that that's going on. I think that the enemy is attacking some of you. Some of you have given place to the devil. And I, and I think that there's a spiritual battle taking place. There may even be a struggle going on inside of you as we're talking about this. But I want you to know that you are safe and sound in Christ from any demonic realm, any demonic spirit that's out there. It says in John 4, 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So Christ is in you and you are in Christ. And an evil spirit is outside of that. And so you are, are, are stronger than any of them. Now, there are those who teach a deliverance movement. And sometimes the deliverance movement is deliverance from demons. Sometimes it's deliverance from family curses. Sometimes they might make up a new kind of deliverance you need to be delivered from. And they teach that every Christian has to be delivered in their deliverance ministry. Now, I have a friend of mine who... He just had a struggle going on in his life. He just seemed to struggle in his walk with Christ always. And he ran into somebody who said, I believe that you are oppressed by, a, by an evil spirit. And he said, let me pray for you. And he sat him down and he rebuked this spirit and he commanded him to leave him alone in the name of Jesus. And he prayed over him. And my friend's life was transformed. He became solid for Christ. He caught on fire. It seemed like the struggles that he was struggling with were taken away. When this, when this man rebuked this, this spirit that had oppressed him. I don't think he's lying. I think it's true. I think that that happened to him. And I think there was a spirit oppressing him. I, I don't know what he did to have a spirit oppressing him as a Christian, but I think we can do some things that would allow that to happen. The problem with the deliverance ministries is when they think everybody has it. See, because if everybody had an oppressing spirit and if in order for you to really be close to Christ, you had to have somebody lay hands on you, rebuke you in the name, rebuke the spirit in the name of Jesus, tell the spirit to get its hands off of you, maybe do that for an hour or two hours until you were finally set free, then somewhere in the pages of scripture would have been direction to do that. When someone's struggling with Christ, when you're apart from him, when you want to be closer, then get somebody to rebuke the spirits that are, are, have power in your life and over you. That's unusual. My friend did something that was unusual. God, sometimes there's things that happen that are unusual. What does the Bible tell us to do if we feel at a distance from him? If you feel like you're struggling with things and you're just not right with God and you need to get right with him, what does the Bible tell us to do? There's a few verses, but one of them is, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Feeling far from God, draw near to him. Make an effort to get close to him. But do you know what the rest of that verse says? Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Maybe you're at a distance from him because you've got sin in your life. Cleanse your hands of that sin. Forgive him. Be like the tax collector who beat his breast before the altar and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And not like the Pharisee who stood and said, I thank you, God, that I tithe twice a week. 
that I pray and that I fast and that I'm not like that Pharisee. And pointed to the guy beating his chest. And Jesus said one of them left forgiven and the other one didn't. The, the prideful, spiritual position you have because of what you do will not do anything for you. But beating your chest and not even looking up to heaven and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, draws you near to him. That's what the Bible says. That's the usual way you draw near to God. Now, I'm not saying that you might not have an evil spirit who is, who is harassing you because the Bible tells us that we need to be aware. It tells us that we are, we're confident, but we need to be aware that there are spirits that try to attack us. And they do that in a, in a few different ways. We are not supposed to be ignorant of the devices of the enemy. Now, I think some of us are. And, and you wonder what the devices are. We, we, we quote things like this. We quote, the Bible says, don't give a place to the devil. And the Bible says, don't be ignorant of his devices. But we don't talk about how you give a place to the devil or how you are ignorant of his devices. And the text of the, of the context of those statements tell us that. For example, it says, don't give a place to the devil. It says, do not steal and give a place to the devil. So by stealing, slandering, living a selfish lifestyle, you can give a place to the enemy. Let me read you this one. This is uh, where it says, well, this is where it says, uh, nor give place to the devil. This is Ephesians 4, 27 and 28. Nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but ra rather let him labor, working with his hands. What is good? That he may have something to give to those who are in need. So the way this person was giving a place to the devil was by stealing. So he says, steal no longer. We're also told not to be ignorant of devices. And look at this context. Now, whom you forgive, Paul said, anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sake in the presence of Christ. He's telling them, you guys have forgiven people around you and I'll forgive them. And, and I'm going to forgive anyone that you forgive. Because forgiveness is part of what we're to do as Christians. We're in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive me my sins as I forgive those who sin against me. And we're to let them go, not hold them to the debt. When someone sins against us, they owe us a debt. Now you let it go. If you don't forgive, what happens? You get bitter. That bitterness grows. You get a root of bitterness in your life and it grows. And the root of bitterness, the Bible says, has defiled many. So what does he say after he says all these things about forgiveness? Then he says this here in 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. Lest, he says, and be involved in forgiveness, I forgive that one for your sake, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So Satan is looking to take advantage of you by you having non-forgiveness in your life. So we do know that he is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he's looking for opportunities to be able to attack you. Now let's take a look at what happened to these seven sons of Sceva that went in and said, we adjure you in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. And the demon said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Verse 16, then the men of whom the evil spirit was, then the man in whom the evil spirit was, leapt on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. One pastor said, that's a bad day. <laughs> when you go in to cast a demon out because you're a Jewish exorcist, and that demon jumps on you, rips your clothes off, beats you up, and you run from the house naked and wounded. It says this became known to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. Remember, Ephesus is now where this power is coming, where the power of reaching Asia Minor is happening. And it says, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Now, why were there so many demons, evil spirits around the area of Ephesus and Asia Minor during those days? Remember that Paul ran into a sorcerer when he was on the island of Cyprus? Do you remember that? And do you remember that as they moved on, there was a girl who was demon-possessed but tell, told people's fortune, told people's future, and, and Paul cast the demon out of her and she couldn't tell the fortune or future anymore. And so Paul gets arrested and beaten in Philippi because he does that. So everywhere they go, they see these demons, but they're connected to the dark arts, to magic. Now, when I say magic, I don't mean Penn and Teller. I don't mean Chris Angel. 
those are tricks. I don't even mean David Blaine, who will stab a needle through his tongue or stab a needle through his arm. He's just learning how to control his body when he does that. I, I, I know a few magic tricks. I'll spare you and not try to do my magic tricks in front of you. I learned them as a teenager because as a teenager, I wanted to be three things. I wanted to be a weatherman, a magician, or a pastor. I don't know. I don't know what that says about me in general at, at all. But I know a few tricks. I can tell you they're tricks. And when you watch things, you think this is impossible, but it's not. They are tricks. They're learning how to do things and they're able to do them, even forcing some things. So when they're reading your mind, they're forcing some things on you. So you're responding in the way they want you to do that. But listen to what it says here. Verse 18. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. So they came believing and confessing what they had done. Also, many of those who practiced magic, the dark arts. This is the sorcerer that Paul ran into on, on, on Cyprus. It's the, the, the girl who told people's fortune in Philippi. Brought their books together, these are scrolls, and burned them in the sight of all. So they brought their scrolls, which told them how to tell spells to curse someone or how to give spells to bless someone or, or how to read someone's future through hyromancy, hydro, hydromancy, which is the pouring out of water. So an individual would take a bowl, they would pour out water onto something that had like a talisman or something. The way the water flowed, they would tell your fortune from that. The same way people do with tell, reading palms today or with tarot cards. That's the same thing today that they were doing in their day. So these scrolls told them how to do it. So they brought the scrolls and they, they burned them. And it says, um, in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them. And in total, it was 50,000 pieces of silver. Today, that would be $5 million. Although probably because of inflation, that's probably five years ago. So today, we were $10 million instead of $5 million because the way inflation is going up. Go to buy a burger at McDonald's, it's 17 bucks for a burger and fries. So something's a problem. But why, was that, why were they so valuable? Because these were valuable items. These were scrolls that some magic man or magic woman had written to tell them how to do these things. And in Ephesus, in the ruins of Ephesus, there's a rich part of town. Most cities didn't have that. There are larger houses. The ruins in Ephesus are absolutely amazing. You've got the library of Ephesus. You've got the theater that's been uncovered that holds 5,000 people. You've got the Agora, the marketplace that's there. And you have this area of town that has huge houses where the rich lived. And so they had these very expensive things. And rather than sell them, they came out and burned them. I remember a friend of mine who got saved when I was a kid. And he listened to, I don't know, Led Zeppelin and ACDC. He went out in his barbecue pit in his backyard and he burned all of his records. His mom called me. I didn't know he did. He was doing it. His mom called me and she said, I, I think he's losing his mind. He's burning all his records and his weed. He was burning both of them in the barbecue outside when he gave his life to Christ. That's not a bad thing, I tried to tell her. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. I know it seems extreme to you, but he wants to get rid of the things in his life that are reminding him of his former life now that he's living for Christ. And that's what they were doing. They're, they're bringing these wicked things in. Now, I looked up an article and I read it on magic of their day just because I wanted to get an idea of what kind of things these scrolls would have said. Here's what I found out. They were, them, um, they were giving themselves over to the learning of magic, what we would call the dark arts. It's not Harry Potter, okay? It, 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 Harry Potter is a fantasy world where none of that exists. There's no such thing as moguls, okay? Well, I guess everybody's a mogul, but if you know the term. But there's no such thing as wizards or witches the way that is. It's a fantasy world. Do you know that J.K. Rollins is a Christian? And she wrote that to bring Christian principles, just like C.S. Lewis did, just like J.R. Tolkien did. There's magic in the Chron Chronicles of Narnia, <laughs> of Narnia. There's a white witch in the Chronicles of Narnia. There's magic in the Lord of the Rings. But it's a fantasy world. This is the world of reality where there are really evil spirits that are empowering people to do things. It says, the, the article went on to say um, that Bible, that uh, magic in the Bible is strictly forbidden, which is described as and includes telling of people's fortune. So if you are involved in having your palm read or reading people's palms or horoscopes 
or any of these, any of these things, tarot cards, then repent, stop, turn away, burn them, get rid of them. Okay? Uh, which, dis um, not only telling people's fortunes, but calling up the dead. Seances. Today, that would be seances. So again, if you're involved in that, then, then get rid of it. If, if you did that in the past, you're now a believer, you don't do that. That's, that's got an evil spirit that's attached to that. Wearing charms, uh, any kind of talisman, anything you hang in your house to give your house good vibes, to have the vibes of the world, like kind of like the New Age movement. You want to be part of the, just have the world good in your creation to be a part of it and to get the vibes. You want to get rid of that? In a house that we bought a while back, there was this weird, I don't know if it was a kachina kind of thing out front by the door. The people left it behind and it gave me the creeps. And I just thought, I don't know what that thing's all about. I'm getting rid of it. Now, I'm not saying if you have Kachina dolls, you should or shouldn't get rid of it. You seek God on that yourself. Okay? I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying anything connected to the spiritual realm in any way. Doesn't mean I don't have decorations in my house that are Native American decorations. Because I, I do. But I'm saying anything that would be spiritually connected, you don't want to have that in your homes. Divination. Which were things that they had. Joseph had a plate of divination where he would tell the future through a plate. Divination is seeking the, the future through something. A Ouija board is divination. When, when I was 15 years old and a Christian, a new baby Christian, we found a Ouija board. Me and a couple of girlfriends, well, a couple of friends who were girls who let me know for sure they were friends, nothing more. We had gotten a hold of a Ouija board. We started messing around with it. We started asking it questions. We asked what the name in the Ouija board was. There's a name of somebody named Roger who was a blacksmith from, I don't know, that, that, and, and there was another name of some witch who was burned for being a witch that was in this Ouija board. And we asked the Ouija board uh, when Jesus was going to return. What a thing. Here we are, young baby Christians, <laughs> divining with a Ouija board, asking it when Jesus is going to return. And the Ouija board says 1975. It's a long time ago. It didn't happen. But at the same time, both Pam, who was one of the girls, and myself began to have weird things happening in our home. Weird things happening at night. I sensed a dark presence in my room that literally terrified me. 15 years old, I'm literally terrified by it. I'm dreaming of a dog-faced demon who is harassing me. And I call my buddy who's at Oral Roberts University. He's a mentor of mine. He's five years older than me. So he's 20. I was, five. I was 15. And um, I told him what was going on. Told him about the Ouija board. He said, first of all, destroy it. Get rid of it. He said, secondly, next time you feel that dark presence in your, in your room, then call out on the name of Jesus because demons tremble at the name of Jesus and Christ is in you. And so what you've done is given the enemy a foothold in your life and now you need to call out on the name of Jesus and forget this nonsense about some spirit guide you have named Roger or her spirit guide that she had who was a witch who had been burned. Forget that nonsense. So think about how deep I got into this as a believer, as a young Christian. Why? Because I'm interested in spiritual things. That's what made me interested in Christ. I was interested in those things. And so the next time I had that sense that he came into my room, I think it was that very night, I called out to Jesus. I just said repeatedly, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And that night I had a dream that this dog-faced demon was outside my window. And like any 15-year-old kid, I looked out the window and punched it in the face. It's the way I think you would want as a 15-year-old, you want to respond that way. But the interesting thing is, it never happened again. Never in my life has any of those things returned. Never have I felt that dark presence at all. When we are involved in things we shouldn't be involved in, we give the enemy a place in our lives. We should have had someone who would tell us to stay away from it, but we found it and we were doing it on our own. We found it while their parents were at work and we're, we're hanging out after school in the afternoon doing these things. Now, let me go on and just read you some more things that says here. Um, so divination, which is speaking to unknown spirits for information, doing readings from the stars, the use of clothing, magic, staffs, mandrakes, instruments, or talismans to be able to bring you peace or good vibes, hair, whispering spells, hydronomy, which we talked about, um, whispering to bring various blessings and curses, being able to make statements to bring curses and blessings into people's lives. These would all be in these scrolls. The use of dreams and rituals and ceremonies to bless and curse people. All were during this time. 
Now, if you want the information that I just read you and the article that I got it from, I just summarized the article. The article is that, you ready for this? I'll give it to you fairly slow and then we'll pray. www.biblestudytools.com forward slash dictionary forward slash magic. You got it? All right, let me give it to you again, a little slower. www.biblestudytools forward slash dictionary forward slash magic. And it will give you all the scriptures and passages where the Bible refers to these. And there's a lot of them in which you find people in the dark arts being involved in biblical times, both Old and New Testament, and what they were like. Now, if you go to YouTube, give, give it about a half a day, maybe later on tonight, go to the description, go to Calvary Tucson with Robert Furrow, go to the description of this teaching, and that link will be in the description. So click on that, it will take you to the article, and you can read about those things yourself. But I'm just gonna close with this. You are secure in Christ. You want to make sure you have a right relationship with him. And you want to give no place to the enemy. And if you're involved in horoscopes, in, in, in the, the, what, star, what sign you're born under, uh, in um, um, any kind of readings or any kind of these spiritual things, get away from them because they are demonic in what they do. Stay away from them as Christians. We should not be involved in them. I don't want to get carried away and say you can't open up a Chinese cookie. Okay to look at the fortune that's in there. It's a strange thing. I opened up one and it said, help, I'm being held captive at a Chinese factory, Chinese cookie factory. <laughs> I stole that from the Big Bang Theory, by the way, if you're wondering where I got that from. I'm not gonna take credit for that. It's so bad, I don't wanna take credit for it. Although I gotta admit, when I'm with my kids and I read it, that's what I read. And they're always like, roll their eyes, ugh, dad. But stay away from all of those things. And if you don't have things right with Christ, then make them right today. When I give the altar call, you don't have to raise your hand, but simply say to him quietly as you're bowing your head before him, Lord, forgive me. I want to wash my hands. I'm a sinner. I want to purify my heart. I want to wear the armor so that I can stand and not give the enemy any areas. And if you're involved in any of the new age stuff that's going on, then turn away from that because those things are not what God is about. They are diametrically opposed to the things that we are taught in the scriptures. So stand with me, would you? And let's pray together. One more thing while you're standing. Sorry. Uh, yoga. It, it, I'm not going to say yoga is wrong to do, but I am going to say the spiritual aspect of yoga is. Okay. Same thing with some martial arts. I'm not going to say doing martial arts is wrong, but if your martial arts, the dojo that you go to, connects it to the spiritual things, then don't be involved in that. Find another place to go. And yoga, if they're doing a time of meditation and they give this kind of spiritual thing with it, then you just go ahead and pray. I actually went to a new age ceremony one time because I wanted to go in undercover and see what was going on. And they had everybody stand up. They were, they in the beginning, they talked about the spirit of the coyote that shows up and the spirit of the owl that shows up at these events. And then when it got around to me, it was time for me to stand up and share something. So I was supposed to stand up and share something spiritually. And I stood up and I said, Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you touch these people's heart, bring them to you. I just prayed for Christ to come in. And the person that was after me was supposed to share was really quiet for a little while. <laughs> like, how do, I, how, how do I follow that? So I'm not saying you can't be, in, be, be around people or the places that might do this stuff. I'm just saying don't be involved in it. Do not be involved in it, all right? So be very careful. Lord, we want to thank you for your word, what it's given us. We want, to, we want to pray that we would be confident that we have you in us and us in you and the evil one can't touch us, but also not give place to the enemy. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in us. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen.